um, many of many of the uh, many of you that registered um, did register for um, multiple sessions. So many of the registrants registered for all five sessions, and uh, there does seem to have been some confusion about how to join each of the sessions. So we, we've actually kind of noticed that um, a lot of uh, participants have been missing the sessions because they've been getting multiple notifications for the, the different sessions that they wish to attend and have not realized that um, the Zoom links are specific for a particular session. Um, so we're only just finding that out late yesterday that many people did not actually join the uh, conference uh, yesterday because they were using the wrong link to attend the, the wrong session. So um, the attendance has been a bit uh, low because of that confusion. Um, so I just want to mention to those, those of you who are currently in this session, who may also be, uh, who also intend to um, join the afternoon session and tomorrow's session, you need to look at the email notifications that you receive and make sure that the notification is for the particular session that you wish to join. So uh, this afternoon session, Open Science Communities. So you cannot use the funding session link to join that link uh, session. So um, I just want all of you to be very observant about that so that um, you don't um, get confused about uh, during the, the various sessions. So the Zoom links are specific to, to a, a session. Um, I hope that's uh, clear. Um, in the background, we're trying to reinform a lot of other people who failed to, to join the conference on that. Um, in, in addition to, to that, um, just a few uh, um, housekeeping rules. Um, uh, if there are any questions during this session, uh, you can please put them in the Q&A chat. Um, and uh, if there is time, and I think there may be some time, if people want to comment, um, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll give you the floor to, to make, uh, make your comments. Um, we have two speakers scheduled to speak to us um, this morning. And um, after they have spoken, we'll have the interactive session. Uh, and so uh, the issue of funding research in Nigeria is a perennial question that needs to be attended to. So we'll be hearing from TED Fund, uh, Professor Popola from TED Fund, although he has not joined us yet. But um, I think the first presentation that we're going to have this morning is going to come from Professor Bjordan Ibinu. I hope I got that right, Prof. Professor, uh, Professor Bjordan Ibinu. Bjordan Musa Ibinu. Ibinu. So Professor Bjordan Ibinu is the yeah. head of the Department of Mechatronics Engineering. He's also the director of the Center of Open Distance and E-Learning at the Federal University of Technology, MENA. And uh, he'll be speaking to us on the topic of overcoming the capacity challenges to access research funding. Now, um, Professor Biodun is an, an academic and a highly motivated career-driven achiever with over 22 years of working experience in the, in the field of mechatronics engineering, autotronics, information and communication technology, and teaching and research. Presently, Akadopreneur Ibinu is a professor of mechatronics engineering 
uh, as I've mentioned, he's the head of department of the Metrotronics Engineering and he's the director for Center of Open Distance Learning. Furthermore, he's an advocate of spiritual intelligence, artificial intelligence and acadopreneurship. Acadopreneurship simply means turning academic ideas into business ventures and startups. And the efforts are ongoing in turning some of his research outputs and that of other colleagues into startup and uh, business ventures. So uh, Professor Bjorden, I'd like to welcome you to, to the conference. And um, I think you have enough, you have enough time. Um, you don't have too much time restrictions at this, uh, at this point. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes, I'm trying to to change my slide to slide mode, but I don't see it responding to my to my click. So just a minute, let me be let me stop sharing and go back to that. Just a minute, I'm trying to. So this morning I will be talking about how to uh, how how can we overcome the problem of assessing research grants, especially from overcoming the capacity challenge. So that's what I will be speaking to us about this morning. So let me just, just hold on a bit again. The, the slide seems not responding, I've closed it and I'm trying to reopen it. So, but, there are certain things I need to, uh, to discuss this morning, which will be very, very good if you are on that same page. Number one, it has to do with what is even, what are the challenges we know about Nigerian academia? Let's even start from there. Challenges we know about Nigerian academia. So the major thing, if I ask you to talk about Niger Nigerian academia will be, like that's what everybody will be saying about us strike that we are very good in going for strike but we do more than that so this morning you will have opportunity to see some of those things we are usually engaged in and which so once again good morning everybody I'm just trying to open my slide and it seems not ready to respond, but now it's now responding. So how my beard side, you know, okay, it has responded. So, so I will just put it in slide mode for us to see now. You're okay, everything seems good now. So let me just go back to that. Okay, screen share. Okay, overcoming share. Okay. Okay, good. By now you must be seeing my slide, which is overcoming the capacity. So this is a, a brief about me and the moderator. has to do with some of the projects I'm the play, that I presently lead as the principal investigator. So I am the principal investigator for artificial intelligence for clean energy, and also the principal investigator for uh, IV for PM, that is intelligent vision for pipeline monitoring. So I've been asked to come about, uh, I've been asked to talk about overcoming the challenges of assessing the sagram. So one thing is that am I just talking from the, maybe I've read it and there's no, I'm talking from experience. So from experiential point of view. So this is just in brief, some of the grants we have found in number in the last eight years. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm going to be speaking to us this morning from experience. And aside from number, Let's look at the word of the brand because you may have grants and the, but I want us to pay attention to the first amount there. 
which, uh, which was in 2013. Attention to that amount. The first grant has to do with just the total what is 220,000 Naira. 220,000 Naira. You may be wondering why am I putting that? It's just to tell you that sometimes you need to start small and success is a journey. In 10, nine, eight years ago, we were talking about 220,000 and you can see how we scale up from 220,000 to 1 million plus to 3 million plus. And now in the last few years, we have been talking about 75 million, 30 million, 40 million and less. So remember, you need to grow. Growth and success is a process, it's a journey. It's not just the destination. So that is what I'm also sharing here. So, so just even in 2020, we have had one or two grants coming in. So I'm talking from experience. So that's another thing you will be taking away from this talk. So this is my presentation outcome. Number one, I will discuss the process of overcoming the capacity challenge. Capacity challenge in assessing research funding. I will talk about that generally. And I will now focus on what is called grantsmanship as a key process. Grantsmanship as a key process. So, but before going further, let's start with this. I need to clarify certain terminologies that will be coming across. So I call this first part of this call, of this talk as conceptual clarification conceptual clarification. First of all, we need to agree and we need to know that assessing research funding is a competition, is a competition. And in a competition, you have to put in your maximum best, maximum best. It's not just an issue of once I submit, I begin, no. Always remember that assessing research funding It's a competition. Number two, you will be hearing academia, academia. So, so you are going to come across. And so first of all, what do I mean by academia? That's the part of the society, especially university that is connected with studying, thinking, research, innovation. In the we are involved with three major things. Three major things. Number one, we call it knowledge generation. Number two, we call it knowledge applied dissemination. During this talk also, I'm going to Yes, I think there was a bit of mix up there, network issue, but I'm back online now. So let me be sure you are seeing me. Okay, fine. So knowledge generation, knowledge application, and knowledge dissemination. Those are the three things we do in academia. Or I think I need to clarify. And the second thing, has to do with invention and innovation. Invention and innovation. So I need also to clarify the difference or differences between innovation and invention. Innovation is just introduction of something new to improve a system and that is you come up with an improvement to the already existing one. Why invention is creation of a product or introduction of a process for the first time. So that's why we can regard Thomas Edison as an inventor, but Steve Jobs, we can only regard him as an innovator. So we need to know the difference or differences between invention and innovation, because this is also critical to our talk today. 
So let's now, again, we need to know that investment is in high quality research is essential for any economy, especially when we are talking about knowledge economy or industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. And also be aware that access to research funding or funding is crucial for high quality research and development. It's crucial to innovation. And that is why research or access to funding is not only about business or it's not only about research. You can also use it to collaborate with the industry in coming up with a product. So research and business community need to work closely together in order to fully benefit from the result of the research because it's about not doing research for research case, but solving societal problem. So research funding is a major priority for virtually all researchers and institutions, and also for some of the startup. With good funding, we can move further. So this morning, I will be speaking to us on how we can collaborate and together achieve the best in overcoming some of the existing challenges associated with research funding. So let's start with challenges to access research funding. What are the challenges to access research funding? Common excuse and what it has to do with finding funders, finding funder or funding agencies. People normally say, oh, but finding funding agency seems impossible. Oh, how do I find partners and do this? All these are common excuses and worries we are used to. So, but one thing I need to let us know is that getting started sometimes is also feeling like overwhelming, winning your first grant. That is why I normally recommend that you start small based on my own little experience. You start small, scale up, and let that, that's the same reason I showed us at the beginning of this, of this presentation, how we started with just winning 220,000 in what in research funding, 220,000 Naira. What are the other challenges that we may, we have? Number one, it's about leadership. Most of us will be complaining about leadership processes in our process in our institution. We are used to that and the university suicidal mission mantra. And I will still talk and then again, playing it all alone, no it all attitude in Ivory to us. And some of the concepts that were, that were put in place for innovation, how we have turned it to industrials. And I will be sharing experience on the one we call final year projects, final year project. Assessing grants, you need to be mentored. And most of us, oh, I don't have mentor, no mentors here. So I've put that one as challenge number five, which is absence of mentoring system and lots more and lots more and lots more. So let's look at what I mean by the selection or leadership process. When you see the requirement to become the vice chancellor of university, there is one in red, and there is one that have bounded the boundaries in yellow. You can see the first one in bounded or with red boundary as very clear, very clear key performance indicators. Candidate must have published minimum of 50 journal articles, ISI and less, one grants and less. And look at the second one. So don't forget what you don't have, you cannot give. You cannot give. So they are someone who is a product of that one bounded in yellow bounded box. We, you cannot compare the output with that one that is in, in bounded in red. So until this, until we ensure that we have key performance indicator, that challenge of, of leadership selection won't really go away. So the, the first challenge or, or solution is having very good key performance indicator at all level, not only for the selection of the vice chancellor, but at all levels. If that's include the dean, the issue, this and the rest. And, and then 
The second challenge I mentioned has to do with university suicide dimension, the way we even recruit. Mostly we recruit based on man no man and some other things. So that's also affecting our selection, our output. And then number three, plain in it alone attitude. Mostly we try to assume that we in academia can play it alone or those in the industry can play it alone. We have forgotten that we need to have what is called, initially it was triple helix, but now we are talking about quadruple helix. Quadruple helix involve the government, academia, industry, and the community. But as of now, part of our problem is about academia. We can do it alone. But we have forgotten that the industry is trying to, to interact with us. That's why we have a lot of banks on campuses, on our various campus and the rest. But are we, are we as academia really going out to interact with them in the industry? The only form of interaction we usually have is when we go, when we are on CWS supervision. And CWS supervision is just one day, maybe every year. That's not enough interaction. So I will also be profiling solutions. So all this, we, firstly, to the problems identified, and then these are some of the solutions I will also be mentioning, like the annual final year project that we have just turned into annual, annual visuals. We need to be looking at how do we introduce fishing, boot camp, exhibition and turning final year project into viable business concept. We call that one hackadopreneurship. I will still be talking about them as we move on. So this is just uh, like a list of likely solutions to all those problems I've identified. So let's now zoom in more on overcoming the challenges to access in the search fund. Right, just as we seem to be getting to the heart of the matter, Prof's uh, connection seems to have frozen. Um, let's just wait and see if it comes back in a few seconds. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. We lost okay, you. Just so, we lost you. Yes. About, so the uh, room cut off now. Yeah. Am I back online now? Yes, you are. So yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, you were just let about. Let me share uh, the slide. Yes. Okay, you, again. Yes, just as you were about to start uh, uh, your slide, you went off, so you can just start uh, from there. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Ten. I guess it is. Thank you. So my colleague here is ready to share his internet with, with me, Prof, I'm very, very grateful. So how to find funding for your research and business? It's not just only about, about academia that, that need funding. We, those of us in the business world also, we may look for funding. Number one is that you need to identify potential funding sources for your research. You need to, and then you need to carefully research the primary sources. And in Nigeria, we, we can divide them into maybe about four types. Number one, federal, state, local government, and even international, international donors. And you can also do what is called private sector funding. Foundations like, like TY Danjuma Foundation is one. We are going to be looking at some of this as we go on. So at this stage, I'm, I'm, I'm still just giving us highlights on how you need to find a potential funding agency. And then focus on finding open or current grant funding opportunities first. Focus on finding, and then when you find one, we are going to look at what are those things you need to do. And again, after finding one and you know the closing date, 
what do you do? You need to develop a work plan using tabular approach or spreadsheet. A typical one is what we have there. And then not all funders or funding agency want to receive a full grant proposal first. Some we want you to submit a concept note first, just like TED fund in the National Research Fund scheme. They say first, you need to submit a concept note. That is one. And then two, if it is about international, what I do, what I've been doing is that get a, a, a research assistant. And how much do I pay a research assistant? We say student with the data rate and the rest, just 7,005 with 1,005 data making 9,000 or 5,000 with one five, with, with one five data making six. Wife training 6,000 to 20,000 naira is an investment. Weekly basis, search for available open grant and compile them, email them to me. Compile them, email them to me. So that is what the is all about. So with that, on a weekly basis, I have a list of open, open funding agency, open calls, and the rest. That's what I have there. So also, you can have this list of lo local funding agency. And then we also have a website where we compile all this. But this, are, this is the list of some of the funding agencies that are local to us in Nigeria. So, and then we have the public one, like the NCC, Ted Funding RF, NEC, uh, all material agencies and less. This is just about locating them. This is just about locating them. So scaling through the first stage of research funding, you have to know that that's the biggest order. And then what are the things you need? Number one, you need just these five things for, the, for, scale, for you to be able to scale through the first stage of any funding agency. Number one, you must keep it brief. Anything you are writing, make sure it is brief, but it address what, why, who, and how. And again, you must explain your idea clearly, especially when you are writing concept note. Concept note may be maximum of two to three pages or 1,500 words. And you need to write to your audience. Don't just write what you have in your mind. Always be, be aware that you are writing to a funding agency and they are your audience and spell out the benefits of what, are, what you are putting together. And again, put it all together. And then th these are what you must always note that for the first stage or for the first grant, you need to really, really focus on program, the availability of fund, scientific merit, and then we'll prepare document. That is, we call that one grantmanship. You cannot prepare your proposal or concept note without being trained. So the process of being trained, we call it grantmanship. I'm going to be talking about that. And then if the funding agencies has a scoring template, be sure you have, you check that for uh, the scoring template. And if they have social media and do, Try to visit the social media and do those, and you interact with persuaders and the rest. So, for scientific merit, you need to ask yourself number one, does it address an important problem? Will scientific knowledge be advanced? And does it build upon or expand current knowledge? Don't forget the distinction I made between invention and innovation. You need to be clear, and you need to ask yourself, is it visible to implement and investigate? All these questions, you need to answer them holistically when you are assessing grants. And then effective communication is important for you to assess any grant, effective communication. And then good grantmanship. Good grantmanship. Good grantmanship. What do we call or what's the meaning of grantmanship? Grantmanship is just the act of acquiring financial grant through the process of grant writing, through the process. Of, and grantmanship is a full time job. It's a full time job. 
meaning that you have to de dedicate yourself to learning it. So your grant writing is a learning skill. You need to learn it or acquire the skill. That is where the issue of mentoring comes in. You can do self-mentoring or you can you can link yourself up with others. So grantmanship is a full-time job. You need to learn about not only how to write, also learn about the grant application process. And it differs from one call to another. So we are still going to be looking at good, good grantsmanship. That is the major way to overcome access research funding access uh, problem anywhere in the world. So let's now look at good grantmanships. What are my own personal suggestions? Number one, you need to, to learn three things when you are when you need to write them. And I've called it act, think, and write. That is you plan you think and you write so the first thing is about planning you must plan what you what you even want to do you think about it it's not only be you you may have group thinking or what is called a retreat where you focus and then you can now start the writing process so suggestion number one for you to overcome the challenge of assessing research funding is that you need to read the application instruction carefully you need to read it carefully, understand it, read it again carefully. And don't forget, you need to read it again or read the application instructions carefully. It differs from one, one funding agency to another. You must note that one. Suggestion number two, collaborate with other investigators as we, for you to be a good grants, for you to have that skill collaborate with other investigator because other investigator will fill that gap in your own expertise and training. In your own expertise and training. And you need to always add critical skill to your team. Don't just ask people to join your team. Always be sure or always ask yourself, what is this person bringing to the team? And you remember, you must remember that team science, teamwork, is the new direction. And for some of us who are in academia or, do, or those of us in the business world, after you must have drafted the finished drafting the first, <laughs> the first uh, draft, show it to someone, show it to one of your colleagues who doesn't know anything about it, who has no knowledge about what you want to do. And if you, after that, you collect it back, you make necessary collection, and you now show it to your colleague who is not your best friend. Your colleague is not a good friend of yours. We help you to read the book and point out every, almost all the errors or the, or, or the shortfall in your work because it's not your friend. We want to show you your shortcomings. So I normally say show your draft application to a colleague who is not your best friend. Such a person will give you a good blind review. And then don't forget that grant writing, starting from concept notes, you need to learn it. And it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. You need to learn it. Writing concept notes, writing full paper, doing the research is a full-time job. Remember that. You need to dedicate time to it. Just the same way some of us have dedicated time to watching football and we have made it a way of life. That's also the same way we need to dedicate time to seeking, sourcing, and writing research proposal. Number four, knowing what to do and how to do it is important when you need to access research grant. And being willing to do it is also necessary. And doing what is necessary is as important as, 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 as your ability to even start. And then, you must understand that most of the funding agencies, they, they do what is called peer review process, peer review. So if they are going to do peer review, it is better you start after completing your draft. Don't rush. Don't plan to, to finish your draft on the day of submission. At least give yourself enough time, uh, two, three days or four days for the deadline. Give it to your colleague to, for, for peer review and you do the necessary collection. And then suggestion number five, 
let your team demonstrate four qualities. Number one, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, collaboration, partnership. Partnership is what I normally emphasize called Lupo Elix. That is, if you are writing from the academy, from the university, every tour, include a startup or, or any member from the industry because with your innovation and less, they may have to take it up. And because of their own experience, they can easily provide market for whatever is coming up. Also know that hierarchy and mix of mentors and mentees must demonstrate a right mix of experts and learners. Don't just put up for people of the same cadre. Show evidence of ment mentoring and understanding. Right balance for representation is so much important nowadays. You have to be gender sensitive. And also, don't forget, all research activities should make effort to cater for gender and the minorities. So when you are writing, you need to take a note of that one. And then let your title to be the summary of the executive summary itself, especially when you are writing concept notes. And the most of your title must show three attributes, innovative approach, the target problem, and have the benefits of the work. So that's another suggestion I want to give regarding your title. So do not forget again, your idea must be easy to, must be feasible, easy to implement and easy to investigate. That's another thing you must always have at the back of your mind. So if you take note of all this suggestion, then you will, you will, you, you, you should be able to overcome the challenges or the challenge of the skill. So let's now go just a step further about our own case at FUT. You know, we have a research group that we call it Artificial in Advanced Engineering Innovation Research Group at Federal University of Technology. You know, let's, let's look at it as a case study in this case. Don't forget everything has to do with leadership, with vision, with mission. So when we started, our idea is to say we, we had the dream, and our dream is to make everything, you know, the maker of mechatronics engineering, the Bethlehem of artificial intelligence, and the Disney world of innovation in Nigeria. So the whole thing starts from the dream. The whole thing starts from the vision. And you can see, so after having the dream, the next thing is looking for funding or looking for vehicle to, to undo that. And we came up with what is called a research group. And the research group is called Advanced Engineering Innovation Research Group. So now we have executed nothing less than 134 projects. We have six academic partners, our team members presently. We are 26, and then we have nothing less than five industrial partners as of now. And you can visit the website, uh, our web, our web, uh, our website for further information about us. We solve the problem of funding for innovation by grantsmanship. Don't forget, grantsmanship means teaching and acquiring the skill. So grantsmanship, as I've said, is a skill, and then you just have to acquire the skill. And now, so you can now see the outcome of our grantsmanship. That is what led to so us having some of these research grants that I've discussed. Then we introduce what is called academic what is academic? I mentioned that there is that tendency, the problem I mentioned first in the university, there are the many gap between creative idea development and commercialization of the idea. We have a lot of published work, a lot of brilliant research output, the final year project lying on the shelf. And we think that we need to take the step, the step further. And one way of doing that is to do, is to last or, or collaborate with the industry. And then for us to do that, we need to collaborate among ourselves in the university. Department A must call, collaborate with Department B, with Department C, and the She simply means turning academic ideas, innovations, concepts and researches into businesses and startups. And from 
what 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 we know entrepreneurship is just the portmanteau the fusion of two words academia and entrepreneurship and we bring four people together number one the government number two the government or the regulators the community our focus is communities because it's the community that we use the product to be produced by the industry and the and the product is being researched by the academia why government provide the initial seed funding in terms of grant and at the end of the day tax the industry uh, get back from the industry to through taxes and through various taxes mechanism and that also generate employment for the community it assists government to solve employment related issue that is what we have done there and then these are some of our objectives when we when we created it to provide the enabling environment capable of notionally innovative academic ideas and business opportunity. Don't forget, among the problem I, problems I listed include lack of enabling environments. So this one uh, happens to solve that. And then to create a national program for student lecturers and entrepreneurs. So we so I will still be talking about it. We have what is called a national program for students, where student goes to the industry to assist in, in product development. One then we have also lecturers joining them, and we also have the industrial expert coming to the university, and then it was meant to generate employment and then offer training and coaching opportunity and create necessary market. So these are some of the programs under the academic and now we achieve it. We have what is called academic immersion program. Academic immersion means that industry experts coming to the university for to take some courses, or even if it is certificate lecture. So we certificate courses, I have you show some. We have jointly developed a lot of courses and curriculum together. And then we have what is called industry immersion program also. That, that means that lecturers and students going to the industry to get immersed. And then we have what is called academic startup that is turning some of the final year projects into business viable businesses and then we, we also have what is called research engagement for academia and industry experts and joint product development we had that so, so this and then yearly at least we have been able to train nothing less than 50 students on yearly basis through this internship opportunity and then business startup 38 and then this is our overall idea about it. So these have been some of the outcomes of that process. And then that's what we have done, graduation of over 30 academic during the first year for academic idea in planning to product. And presently at Laboratory Model, we have the, we now have our incubation or we have our startups and uh, and then create a generating employment and again what is it about it's about skill graduates producing them and that's part of all then we introduce other programs which include i mentioned that we try to change final year project from just project which introduce career talk because not everybody wants to start his own business some want to go to the industry we provide necessary mentoring through the career talk for them and then for and then we also introduce project execution and the rest. and then we also introduce what is called long life learning system then we introduce lifelong lifelong learning or what is called mentoring and then what is don't forget mentoring can be described as effective tooling people development and then that's what we have done so part of it is that we have the technical mentoring and then we have the academic mentoring so let me just pause on this academic mentoring uh, one way we have to do that is to introduce what is called PhD clinic. PhD clinic is just our aim is to provide support mechanism 
two PhD candidates during the period of study. I tell you, within the last three years, we have produced nothing less than uh, seven graduates, so, and then nothing less than several SI journal papers with over 12 conference papers just from the member. So we don't just talk about mentoring, we have the technical mentoring and academic mentoring, and that's why. So not only that, start in our classrooms, we now go to them, we have been to and we have been to so many companies or industries in the last few years. And a way of concluding. <clears throat> it looks like we lost. Uh... We lost you as you were making your concluding remarks. Yeah. You're back now, if you can just uh, conclude. Yes, I can quickly conclude. So the most important thing is that it doesn't matter. When you look at this man that is being shown on the screen now, you will see that the man has nothing less than 40 ladders there. And then what the man just needs is just one or two ladders there. But it's not making wise use of his resources. So this is the similitude of what we have in our higher institutions, in our startups, in our industry. Instead of us to collaborate, instead of us to optimize the usage of available resources, we try to do Oh, I know it all or playing it alone syndrome. And that's why we are not making use of. Let's look at it. Let's look at one of these first generation universities. On a yearly basis, they graduate over 5,000 students or they had made 5,000 students. That means 5,000 potential ideas. Let's say the success rate is just 10%. What is the, what is 10% of 5,000, the number inside. If we have just that succeeding in it in just one university, you can now see the multiplier effect of that one. So the bottom line is that we are not making use of our available resources. So for us to move forward, we need to have good grantmanship and implement some of those things I've mentioned. But the most important one of them is good grantmanship. It is on this note, I say thanks a lot, everybody. And thanks, thanks for listening. And, and I'm hoping for question, discussion, and collaboration at Federal Arts. Fed. So don't forget, should you need to discuss with us and this at FUT and through the organizer, you're highly welcome. Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you very much, Professor Abiodun Aibini. That was a very uh, comprehensive uh, and informative uh, presentation. And um, thank you, very informative. And certainly, um, I, was, uh, from an Echo Connect perspective, will certainly want to reach out to you um, on some of the initiatives that you've um, instituted. Um, like somebody mentioned in the comments section, I like the whole concept of the acadopreneurship. You know, uh, in a co-connect, we tend to call it edupreneurship. But um, yes, there's, there's a lot of overlaps and insights there. Um, I just want to, because I know uh, Professor Biodun has to go somewhere else shortly. Normally, we would let the next speaker make his presentation and then take the questions uh, after um, all the presentations have been made, but I, I'm also conscious that you have some other um, obligations. So are there any questions for Professor Ibinu? If there are, you can put them in the Q&A chat or um, raise your hand, or if any of the panelists have any comments or questions, um, we can do that before I introduce um, the next speaker. I see a hand raised. It's been raised for a while. Um, Juwaria Badamisike. Um, 
I don't know if you have, do you have a comment or a question? You can't speak. Right. Um, my hand has gone down. Um, so I guess you don't wish to speak. Right. If you wish to speak, uh, Juwaria, please um, speak. I think your, your mic has been enabled. Or tell us that you don't want to speak. Let us know for, for sure. Right. The, uh, the, the presentations, the slides will be made available at the end of the conference. And I, I believe on uh, one of his concluding slides, uh, his contact information is on the on the slide, so that will be shared um, with, with, with everyone that's attended. So um, I think you have that um, information. Um, I do have one question. I think there is a question here on the chat chat platform, sir. Can you check on the chat platform? Yes, that please prof, kindly share your email or put the young researchers overcome trust issue among scholars. Okay, um, you can deal with that question. Yeah, okay. Now, the issue about trust has to do with the young scholar himself, trusting himself. If you don't trust yourself, you can't trust anybody. That is one thing. Let me be sincere. If you don't trust yourself, you can't trust anybody. There's nothing, anything anybody can say uh, to you that will make sense. Let me also tell you, uh, from my own experience, nobody is interested in stealing your idea. What's the idea that anybody will, There are, mm, in the parlance, we normally say, you know, um, uncountable ideas. Uncountable ideas. And have you even read some stories about Nobel Laurel? Prize winner that they are they will be located at different parts of the world, working on the same thing and never met until the time of the award. Now, say someone is working on this and you. So, if it can happen to Nobel Prize winner, then who are you? Not so. The first thing I will say is that get to know that if it is your idea, it's your idea. Nobody can steal it, even if you share it, even if you put it in black and white and someone get hold of the document, implementation can never be similar. If I write step by step of how to do it and I've not had anything in it and I give you, to implement it like me, it also be another, another problem. We also so nobody will ever steal your, your idea. So the first thing I normally advise is that get a mentor. If you don't trust your mentor, whom will you trust, number one? If you don't trust your colleague, whom will you trust? Number two. Number three, if you don't trust your senior colleague, whom will you trust? Number three. So the first thing is that start for by trusting yourself, one. Number two, if you are still deficient or poor in trust, I say poverty of trust, if you are, if you are, if, if you are blessed with it, what you are just to do is that when you need to communicate with anybody, communicate officially via email. Like now, I have an idea and I want to share the idea with you. I send you an email about the idea. That email, you see, we have a timestamp. And that timestamp is an evidence that the idea originated from me and I discuss it with you on so, 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 so date. And that's so, and you start to work after that on that. So that's another way. Don't use chat unless, and then even if you use chat, try to document it, do the screenshot. So one thing is documentation. That's number one. Number two is that, or just have it at the back of your mind that nobody can steal your idea. Now, if you now write, and you can lead, like in the case of TED Fund, the rule is that you must be of senior lecturer, kida and above before you can be principal investigator. There is nothing bad in sharing your idea with someone who is of that kida, SL and above. And the person can put you as part of the team. Don't forget, it's not every time that you must lead. Sometimes the gain for you is being in the team being in the winning team. 
So if someone is taking the glory, just take it that very soon, it will soon be your own turn and you too, you will be leading. So, but don't forget when you go and look at the problems I listed, poor followership is also it. We have some, yes, you have the idea, but you are even looking down on the leadership. So nothing can work. So to me, I have, I have, I have suggested three approaches. Number one, to communicate it to a senior colleague, put it in black and white for him to see. And when you are communicating so that you have evidence, that's number one. Number two, work on your, let's work on our individual mindset and be sure that nobody can steal our idea. That's number two. And then number three is that even if someone steals your idea, the person cannot implement it like yours and take glory that yes, someone stole the idea and is implementing it and it is working the way I want. It's, it's also a glory to you. So I hope I've, I've answered it in my own little way. Thank you. Yeah, that, it's very interesting um, uh, what you've just said, Prof. Um, because you know, a, a part of the you know the the running theme with this conference is all about openness, open science, open research, open access, and yet there is this kind of uh, contradiction where we're talking about this openness in our uh, research practice. Uh, making uh, research available in an open manner, and yet there is this uh, still this kind of uh, idea by um, by researchers to hold on to to their research and personalize it, personalize their research, and almost always seeking how do I monetize my research? So how do we marry those contradictions? And um, Professor Conrad, um, you have your hand raised, and I, I wonder if you can speak to that question as well before yeah. we change. Uh, uh, can you hear me well? I can hear you clearly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, very uh, clearly. I believe that our um, is a national challenge, and I think um, it has to do with the. Uh, the thinking that an innovation, a research, or an invention means money. Uh, and we do not know that there's a whole uh, distance between having an idea and turning into money. Uh, so much that you find that um, uh, when people have even the tenets of ideas, um, they want to see how much money they can make out of it. Uh, I will give you a little um, insight into how bad this is. If you were to go to um, Google Store, for example, you will find that almost every little app made from our end has a money price on it already. Yet, there are a whole lot of apps there made from the other side of the world that are free. And uh, you get to use it. Let's take um, uh, color ID, for example. A lot of us are using one or two color IDs. There's no price on it. You use it after a point, they tell you pay for the premium one. Even the Zoom we are Zooming today, when it started, it was all just there, out there. So there's this similar hunger to make every little buck out of every little thing that we have. And that's essentially the thing. So if you have an idea, you think, oh, I'm going to make hundreds of millions of naira out of it, then you go into the protectionist mode. And when you go into that mode, of course, you will, you will start and run it with distrust. So like Prof. Godwin said, is a problem that starts with you. If you cannot trust people, it's because you cannot trust yourself. And it's because you think that uh, you're just going to make money out of it. But I can tell you, our research center here, yeah, you have a lot of innovation and this thing that never made it to the market. And we never make it to the market because some of them are not even marketable. 
So you have to go and sometimes it's when you share, when you are open, that you can find other things that can come in and impute in things into that idea or innovation and, and invention that will not make it robust enough to make it to the market. So essentially, uh, the monetization of our, our national psyche is what is really the challenge. And I think we need to do a lot about that. And I also begin, I also want us to note one thing as a random that a lot of us as people do not understand the issue of openness. When you, when you say openness, they think a place to just keep taking and taking and taking. There's no contributory mentality to the openness thinking around us now in Nigeria. When you say openness, oh, it's a, a place you go and you just take. The question is who, who put in there? So the contribution mentality needs to come. In. And that's why the openness thing, even though we're trying to drive it, you have this lockdown of trust and uh, what do I get out of it by everyone? I like the rest my little contribution. Thank you. Jessa, uh, if I'm just, let me just have to watch Prof just said, and I'm very happy Prof have eat it very well about our mentality. I think also part of what we need to do by our culture in some part of Nigeria or in Africa, let me even generalize. Yeah, Africa. In, yes, we can share space. We are open as, as per space, but we are not open about knowledge. We are open about space, but we are not open about knowledge. But in the West, they are open about knowledge and not open about space. What do I mean? Me and Prof and the moderator, three of us, can share one room for one year without even fighting each other. We will even be living happily Indeed. in just one room. Indeed. In just one room by our, by our culture, by our approach. Each person take his corner and the rest. But when you come to, and you will see us, that's our community, that's our culture. That's why we live in Komuna, in Opens. You may wake up, if Prof is domiciled in, in, in Nigeria, in any town in Nigeria, he may just wake up one day and find a little girl with a note at her hand and say it's from a friend to your auntie who is a cousin to your niece. And I send the little girl to come and be living with you. In our culture, we will just say, hey, okay, come in. And, and she, she, has, she will become part of the family. We are hoping to, but when we now come to knowledge, we are not open at all. That's why even our forefathers, all our local hubs and rest, all, all our sciences died with, with every generation. We don't transcend it from one Indeed. generation to Indeed. another. And the main cause also has to do with monetization. As, as Prof have said. So what we now need to do, to me, is cultural reorientation, as we are doing now, that we need to now stop asking ourselves, as Prof asks, who has, who has actually put it there? And what am I going to contribute to actually add more? And to now be telling ourselves that, yes, the same way we can share space, that's the same way we should now be sharing knowledge. That is one way I ought to start the reorientation. And also to be, start, to be asking ourselves that that thing I'm taking, who put it there? What is going to be my own little contribution also? So let's start with contributing little. Like even your source code, your MATLAB and this, share some part of it. So though, some of us, we normally think that it is when we attach money. Don't forget, as Prof said, Zoom and less, they have been using what is called freemium, freemium business model. Freemium means that you have some aspect of it that is free, but if you need advanced feature, you now pay premium price. So free plus a price, they give us freemium. We can always, we can start from that side, that let's start, and again, Lastly, part of what we can now be doing is volunteering. Yes, we can volunteer 
or skills related, we are good in that. But we cannot volunteer when it comes to knowledge. That is why our father, our mother say, hey, don't tell anybody. Oh. That is our business <laughs> secret. Oh. Don't let the person in the next house look at it. So to me, and my suggestion is that we, the young ones, we should key into this issue of open source, open knowledge by starting from what is called freemium, by having the orientation and start with, let me contribute small, no matter how small it might be. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for, for that. Um, there's just one question in the Q&A chat, which I, I think is pertinent. Uh, we can just talk about that for a couple of minutes before. Uh, we present the next speaker. And uh, it's from Adeyemi Adetula. She says, uh, it says, um, considering that this event is on open science, is there any advice on the relationship on grant applications and open science practices, especially as it concerns research in Nigeria? I don't know if any of the panelists might have a, a comment to make on that. What's the question again? Please come again, please. The question is, uh, considering that this event is on open science, is there any advice on the relationship on grants application and open science practices, especially as it concerns research in Nigeria? What I may do is um, if I can find the speaker, maybe I will unmute her or him and uh, see if we can express that a bit more clearly. So I'm going to let the, the, the questioner um, speak. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can you introduce uh, yourself, please? Yeah, I think my, my question is just related to... Oh, can you introduce yourself, please? Okay, uh, I'm Adeyemi Aditula. Uh, from the University of Alex Ikweme Federal University okay. in Indufu, Alike, Ebony State. Okay. Yeah, so I I joined this uh, event because of the nature of open science. And I'm just wondering maybe, are we limited uh, in terms of how we apply for grants? Because we don't have, uh, we don't know much about open science practices. Is that something that we should be thinking about? We certainly should be uh, a day me, and I hope you. I hope you'll be able to join us in the afternoon session because we're going to have quite a few uh, uh, knowledgeable and expert speakers uh, uh, who are very familiar with open open science that could probably talk to to this issue. The awareness of open science, open research, open access is still very low um, in Nigeria. And so I, I think uh, when we, we talk about all the approaches for funding, we still look at them uh, from the maybe more traditional perspectives because we haven't yet really understood um, the, um, the, power, the open science and open research paradigms. And uh, that is certainly something that um, Echo Connects as an NREN wants to promote. Um, and I think it is as open science uh, becomes more pervasive and there's more understanding about it, I think it is all about trying to have the systems and ecosystem, uh, a kind of research ecosystem that revolves around open paradigms that's going to address your question. So for example, if we're having scholarly outputs and research outputs going into uh, repositories or open access repositories that are uh, um, indexed and adhere to uh, uh, standards for availability and discoverability, you might find that there will be funders and investors who are actually actively looking for those um, those researchers to collaborate with and actually fund. So it is also uh, about being able to build the correct ecosystem and infrastructure to actually help to promote the visibility 
from which the, the, those opportunities um, should uh, come out of. And that for us, a uh, co-connect as an NREN, that is something that we're very, very uh, uh, interested in doing. We know that there are a lot of initiatives from TED Fund and other organizations about developing national repositories or, or um, certain kinds of repositories. But uh, we want to make sure that these um, repositories are built in a manner that they adhere to open standards um, so that local and international collaboration can go on and funding local and international funders can actually find those um, those uh, um, research outputs that they may be interested in collaborating on, expanding on, as Professor Bjordan had said, or even um, funding. And uh, I think if you join the afternoon session, uh, we might be touching on, on, on some of that as we talk about uh, creating uh, open science communities on our campus institutions. Uh, Professor Conrad, I, I saw your hand up temporarily. Did you want to make a comment or? Oh, um, yeah. Um, it's just to let um, him know that most global funders now and uh, most of the people you want to apply to actually now have open science, open access policies that require you to uh, publish their work through an open access route. So basically, uh, you know, it's a revolution and I'm concerned that he probably will come like every other revolution, whether it was a green one or whatever one and leave us behind. So we really need, I don't want to speak too much, but I just want you know, that that has become a standard going forward for whether you're seeking grants or whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Conrad. Okay, and uh, I think Professor Biodun, th uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very, very informative. I had lots of questions I wanted to ask, but um, time would not really permit to ask uh, a lot about the, the work you're doing in Footmina and some of the things you presented to us about how to prepare for research grants. I know you mentioned something about gender and minorities. so. From a Nigerian perspective, I was kind of interested in who, who you refer to as minorities. But again, we can we can always uh, deal with that. Okay. At, yeah. Okay. Okay. At, um, at another time. So before okay. I introduce uh, the next speaker, um, I just want to remind everyone because uh, uh, a lot more people have joined uh, the session, um, and maybe this was a. a, a um, sort of over, uh, uh, something we overlooked on our part. Uh, many of you that registered have registered for all the five sessions of the conference. And so what will be happening is that you'll be receiving email notifications a week to a day to and an hour before the particular session is to start um, with a Zoom link where basically the email says, click here to join. Now, uh, we've, we, we only discovered late yesterday that many people, because of the number of emails they were receiving, were trying to join sessions using a link that was assigned to another session. And so therefore they, they, they were unable to join. So this is just sort of information for all of you, particularly those of you who will be joining the afternoon session. The link you use to join this session on improving funding is not the same link that you would use to join the afternoon session. There will be a separate uh, notification with a different Zoom link. So I think an hour before the, the session starts, there will be a, an email notification to ask you to join uh, the session with that link. So please, uh, for those of you who want to join in the afternoon and for tomorrow's um, session as well, please note that the, the Zoom links are session specific. So you cannot use the link uh, for this session to join uh, other links. So check your emails, look at the notification, check that the, it is for the session you want to join and then you use that particular link. 
So, um, and we do apologize that uh, next time we try to make that a bit clearer and more straight, straightforward. So, um, I want to introduce um, our next speaker. And it is um, Professor or the, um, Dr. Mustafa Ayo Popwala. And he'll be talking to us uh, on research funding uh, opportunities. Um, uh, Dr. Popola is actually the technical assistant to the executive secretary of uh, TED Fund. So um, I, I believe his, his uh, presentation will be heavily, heavily talking about what TED Fund are doing in terms of research funding uh, opportunities. Um, so Dr. Popola is an associate professor, fellow of global studies at the Center of Excellence on Migration and Global Studies uh, at the National Open University of Nigeria. And uh, presently he's the coordinator um, and technical, uh, of the technical coordination team of the uh, Research and Development Standing Committee, RDSC, um, that was inaugurated by the Minister of Education with an overarching goal of promoting the establishment of National Research and Development Foundation in Nigeria within the context of the quadruple helix model, something I think Professor Biodun just touched on. He is the chair, he's also the chair of the Innovative Agricultural Postgraduate Training Program being facilitated by the African Union Arm on Agricultural Research Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa in collaboration with TED Fund. And this is known as the Agricultural Research and Innovation for Africa, uh, ARIFA, which is a flagship program of FARA geared towards the capacity strengthening of new generation of agriculturists for value addition on the African continent. He is also serving on the National Research and Development Foundation Executive Bill Drafting Committee among other national assignments. And uh, uh, Prof, I'll be asking you about where we are on that with the NRDF. Um, he's also the convener of Business to Business um, Nigeria with membership across five continents, leveraging the innovative, continuous and lifelong um, business education platforms provided by B2B Nigeria through her monthly business priming, pitching, and networking sessions. Professor Hopola is a visiting researcher at Mississippi State University in the US and was, the, was at the University of Molis Campobasso, Italy, and the Institute of Farm Animal Biodiversity Austria, uh, Austria for his postdoctoral work. He's a fellow, he's a fellow Institute of Chartered Economists of Nigeria, Development Practice Academy, Chartered Institute of Corporate Mentoring and Coaching of Nigeria, and Institute of Management Consultant. And he's also a certified commercial diplomat at the City of London in the UK. He's happily married with children. Uh, so, Professor Popola, I know you don't normally like to be called that, but I think you are a prof. So, uh, we'd like you to uh, start your presentation. Would you mind, Prof, if you can actually put your slides into slide mode so we can see them more clearly? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, okay. Let me let me start on a positive mode. That uh, actually joined and I was enjoying the conference myself. So very good that I'm not a speaker. I'm just uh, listening to. Uh, but uh, the other side of it is that it was part of my time. 
our other hand, I have nearly 10 minutes for that meeting. So let me see what I can cover within that period, uh, because uh, by 11.30, like uh, I was shared, I think I'm supposed to be in another meeting. Uh, yesterday, I was able to start up, and uh, let me sincerely appreciate the connect for making this happen again, again, and uh, I'm pulling all, I can see almost everybody friends that we have been speaking about something related uh, within the space of uh, making Nigeria a greater nation when it comes to RMD division platforms and uh, provided the necessity in terms of uh, digital transformation to support whatever we want to do. Um, thanks to Professor Ibino, um, thanks to Professor Conrad, and, uh, when they have been trying to pull everybody together to make this happen. Uh, let me just uh, make progress on uh, what I started discussing uh, about the yesterday, which is uh, the funding uh, opportunities when it comes to r and that uh, third fund provided. I think I was able to turn up with uh, the fundamental ones and uh, the traditional ones that were known to people, which are essentially part of the intervention lines of third fund. I spoke about the IBHR yesterday, institutional based research. I spoke about the NRF, which is the National Research Fund. I moved on to talk about the Academic Research Journal that is going to be a platform or I mean, uh, an, a facility to communicate uh, the outcome of, of those research. I discussed the issue of academic publishing centers. The third one is actually, has actually created and established and um, equipped about uh, six of them in each geopolitical zone so that we can actually publish at a very low cost. I move on to talk about uh, the book development, which is an aggregate of um, whatever we know that speaks to the content development and in our national uh, reality uh, context. Uh, because many of the books that are in our universities or our institutions, we later realized some of them are having content that uh, does not speak to the national realities or priority as an African and as a Nigerian. So, and uh, yes, some of them are useful, but uh, at the same time, we need to actually domesticate knowledge. Uh, and that's going to be part of the decolonization we are talking about. Yes, Nigeria is an independent country, but when you look at our educational system, you can see that um, we are still colonized. And that's why we have a big challenge to have a breakthrough uh, listening or learning uh, those content with those curriculum, and uh, we expect to actually be a better person. Now, it's an inherited curriculum. The pedagogical approach that was used, it is strange to the African mentality. And we actually do better by actually decolonizing uh, the education uh, space generally. So um, that was why the intervention when it comes to the issue of book development in terms of the town. Uh, but there are going to be a lot of improvement in the processes and the uh, ways that things have been done in that space too, uh, hopefully, as uh, we actually raise up uh, on the issue of shift across board and intervention lines, 15 of them at state fund. And uh, some of the innovative funding that we're discussing today, uh, starting from the virtual training hubs that we have actually deployed, and we are looking at transforming that virtual training hub to innovation platforms. That particular project is being done with uh, our partnership with the uh, Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. Uh, that is the, uh, that's part of, I mean, they are the core uh, sponsor or the core leader uh, of the Arifa project that was just mentioned. And uh, during the pandemic, we were able to successfully make our students to collaborate with their colleagues worldwide uh, using this virtual training hall. And they're actually attending classes in Brazil because all of them are students of University of Isosa through our South South Triangular Agreement that we have with them, Court Sefara and the African Union. And uh, we're able to fund actually funded the factual training hall. And that factual training hall actually provided opportunity for the master student to attend lectures. And I think for a whole session, some of them are actually finished the academic work. They're just leaving for Brazil now to go and do part of the research work. Uh, the next phase of the development in that space is that uh, by February uh, next month, the Brazilians are coming and we're actually having a conference around transforming those virtual training up into innovation platforms. So that is for us to look and focus on uh, 
value addition in the agricultural space using smart technology and precision um, advantages that we have across the board. We have those interventions uh, already completed and we have students on them. As of yesterday, because I chair the Arifa program in Africa, we have one on one, -on -one student that has been uh, enrolled. And uh, let me say that Nigeria actually is the one that is leading across the continent because the total slot under that particular program, because I think it's more or less free tuition uh, from the Brazilian government, is 120 in total, and 180, sorry, in total. And the tech fund actually grabbed about a 120 slots, and we've been able to fill 101 slots as at yesterday, already admitted, some are already completing their masters, and then they will actually proceed automatically to PhD if they have a, a, a PhD grade under that. The idea is to actually pick a resource in Nigeria, a particular resource in the agricultural space and transform it into something that can be found in any hypermarket, not only supermarket across the world. So those centers are located in the West of Lagos, Nairobi, Benin, Abukata of our Balloon University in Bauchi, University of Jos and Michael Opera University. The future of a sustainable innovation platform, like I mentioned, and uh, actually the future is here because that we actually uh, need to deliver it in the next uh, quarter. So uh, moving on, part of uh, another innovation that uh, we've actually done in terms of funding is that the president of uh, Nigeria, Professor uh, President Mohamed Buhari, actually in 2020 approved the first centers of uh, the first set of. Uh, third fund centers of excellence. Uh, why do we do that? Because uh, the African centers of excellence are being funded by the World Bank. Uh, have peculiar areas that they are covering. And we actually understood that to see that, yes, if African, I mean, if World Bank are funding centers of excellence. And provincial, we need to realize that uh, why our universities can be calibrated or can be ranked like others across the world is because, I mean, it's, until when they develop their steps into a center. I mean, they have centers of excellence within them and they are well developed in such a way that they can exhume excellence across, across board. So what African Center of Excellence is all about by the World Bank is to actually looking at different uh, areas uh, of uh, special needs uh, across each country and look at how they can and make a university to specialize in them. So when we look at the areas that were not covered by the African Centers of Excellence being funded by World Bank, we came to a conclusion that for our university to become specialized, we need a situation whereby we started investing in centers of excellence. And as, as you have seen them, we have the first 12 across the universities and those are their areas of specialization. And all of them are, have a funding line of 1 billion naira each. So meaning that 12 billion naira portfolio uh, was created for centers of excellence, 100% uh, funded by a tech fund uh, in the year 2020. Uh, under our 2021 budget, we move forward to look at what we can do at the Polytechnics and Colleges of Education based on the law of tech fund that allows 50% into university of any of the intervention we are doing, 25% to Polytechnics and the 25% to Colleges of Education. And these are the newly created centers of excellence in the 2021 budget and uh, uh, all of them were just uh, uh, been taken through what we call the uh, first level of uh, local induction. Ideally, what we are going to be doing with them, like what we did with the university that are, are leaders, are, I mean, that are going to be the leaders in the centers of excellence is what we call an innovative uh, induction program that we tag training and training. We actually need to make them to undergo some immersion in, and existing centers of excellence in Africa and beyond. So under our uh, different arrangement and the partnerships I'm going to be discussing, you're going to see what we have done with them. But it is important for everybody to know that these particular centers of excellence and other 12 are actually having a funding line of 1 billion naira over five years. And uh, in all, we've actually committed about 24 billion naira in terms of funding and uh, essentially, these centers of excellence are going to be looking at cutting edge uh, research. They're going to be looking at a partnership and uh, a lot of uh, things that uh, many researchers can actually do with these centers. The focus for the polytechnics is going to be on skill development and entrepreneurship. 
why that of the colleges of education is going to be on the pedagogy and curriculum uh, development going forward. Uh, the new Tetron Mega Research Grant is important. It's important for us to know that uh, try as much as possible to look at our national priorities and they see how we can actually deploy fund and encourage, uh, a, I mean, a high level R&D that is even beyond what we have as the National Research Fund. Under this arrangement, 1.25 billion was actually committed to four projects that I'm going to be talking about. And uh, it's very important for us to know that this is our own response to national priority. This is our way of encouraging multi-institutional, multi-locational and uh, cross-functional research in such a way that we can actually deliver some tangibles, not in piecemeal. We are looking at what we can take to table and we can say this is going to be a product of the R&D we are talking about. It encourages the activation of people-centric triple helix model. And then, like I said, it actually gives response to national issues. By the time I talk about it, you're going to know. Our output and outcomes from this uh, is expected within 24 months. And that is our charge to those people. The first one that got uh, the first cluster under this arrangement is about vaccinology and vaccine nationalism. You agree with me that uh, when we have COVID, countries are actually taking care of their citizens before they can actually bring the rest to any part of the world. It has happened, it's a fact. So when there's going to be future pandemic, what's going to be our preparedness? So that one is looking at making sure that uh, at least we break the boundary and that becomes one of the countries that can be posting around this vaccine nationalism. If we cannot do anything much, let us take care of ourselves. As at yesterday, uh, the NCDC was reporting, no, sorry, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency was reporting that about 14 million Nigerians have been vaccinated since when COVID started. I mean, that is a baseline low. It is not up to even 10%. percent Why we are talking about 50%, 70% in some other country, and they're actually talking about herd immunity. That's why you can see UK said, yes, we can remove masks. So, I mean, in Nigeria, we are looking at vaccines from all over the world. We have different, uh, we have different variants of vaccine and people are just taking it. And I mean, we don't think that uh, this is too good as a country, despite fact that uh, we actually, uh, we need to respect our sovereignty. So this cluster of uh, uh, people that are uh, of institutions that we know they have, we have, have actually access and they have a big role to play in this, we are put together and uh, they are being funded to the tune of 450 million to deliver the candidate vaccine uh, on COVID in the next 18 months. And you going to use that infrastructure and the platform that's going to be created through that funding for future pandemics. Uh, the next one has to do with 250 million. That one is looking at phytomedicine and therapeutics. And like you are going to agree with me again, using the case study of uh, uh, COVID uh, in the UK, in Spain, and some other places, it is coming to become uh, one of the diseases that has to be healed using some drugs on a sustainable basis. Whenever COVID comes, you get it treated and you can do it your way. So beyond vaccine, we have a lot of resources in this country, biodiversity. And uh, as of now, we don't even know what potentials they have. But you're going to agree with me that our alligator pepper and the, the little polar has become some of the premium products in the market now. Why? Because of the potentials. And then when they were actually subjected to in clinical science for analysis, we can see some level of their efficacy to COVID-19. So a lot of things around that, and the third one is looking at it that we can continue that way. At least at frame in Ibadan, we have about 150,000 uh, halves and uh, resources that have, have actually been bookmarked here, but we are looking at them being digitized and they're making them available at uh, a very, uh, Staff for us to actually use those resources and come up with APIs that is active pharmaceutical ingredients that we can use uh, going forward and that can be part of the export product. The third one has to do with uh, uh, defense and security. I will not talk much about that, but these are the people that are involved and then we are clear about what we want to deliver to Nigeria because we have done a lot of engagement to see that it is going to be abysmally poor for us as a country to be begging on things that we can actually deploy and develop. It may surprise you that uh, in this country, we have plants 
that is being that can be processed and be converted to uh, what is known as the gunpowder. I don't want to talk much about what we are doing around this, and I think uh, we actually deploy uh, because whatever we are doing as a people, including the institutions that we are funding, if they are not secured, then we are not in any business. So for all of us, that fund is actually looking at it from the prism of nationalism and see what we can do around the uh, defense. And the last one has to do with our nutritional security in the areas of dairy, about 1.5 billion USD for importation of dairy products for many years now, maybe since inception of this country or, for, or maybe from since independence. Uh, the impact of that is actually on the capacitation of uh, our of the brain of Nigerians. And uh, we can see a lot of limitation, uh, a lot of challenges. And uh, the role make play in childhood upbringing uh, is obvious across the world. And that's why for any other for many other countries, you're going to be seeing them at least a couple of make -up. Why Nigerians and uh, many Nigerians have been living on animal fat that is being instituted as milk? We found that one highly unacceptable going forward. And uh, we actually want to interject, I mean, we actually want to intervene and make sure that at least we come up with a strategy, research model, and uh, at the same time, using this one to combat the issue of uh, elders and farmers. Uh, crisis that uh, by the time we come up with models, I'm actually working with the University of Florida around that because we visited our and see that uh, people are not uh, much about. And uh, I think part of the topic is to speak about some collaboration. I'll just speak about very few of them, very few of them that we think they are very strategic to this particular discussion. The first one is that as of today, Ted Fund has actually joined the Science Granting Council Initiative. In that council, uh, we have funding. Uh, through the FCDO, uh, the Canada International Development Research Center, IDRC, and the South African National Research Foundation. And uh, the aim with Nigeria actually through third fund becomes the 16th country to join that platform. And I think uh, that's a good one for us because even early this year, we actually get some funding uh, to support some of the policy review that we need to do at third fund. Um, Morgan State University, we have about 25% discount on every fee that we're going to pay on PhD training. And for the first time, we're able to negotiate wafer for, to, uh, for TOFU and uh, IELS, all these uh, uh, use of English is that uh, we believe that the scholars in Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigerians are actually taught English language from primary school to university level. And uh, since we train many of the teachers in the university, we saw it as an insult for Nigerian teachers to be requested to bring another test of English at that level. So we negotiated it for the first time. We are able to bring that you can uh, our scholars going to the US now are uh, like normal US citizens and without all these uh, encumbrances of that uh, kind of uh, test of TOEFL and the test of mathematics and English and stuff like that. Under the Arriva, I mentioned what we have done, but uh, by April this year, we're going to God's willing, we're going to be incorporating about 40 Brazilian universities into this particular program of Finland, And for Finland, we actually have a collaboration with a whole city uh, and uh, five universities in that consortium. We are going to be looking at the thematic groups uh, of uh, the RD, uh, I mean, of the NRD. And uh, the first session that we have with them was just last week. And it was a successful session. And I will look at how we want to do how we want to do intelligent mind. I mean, and a lot of new things that uh, like I mentioned, we're actually ongoing discussing with the University of Florida, University of Rwanda, we're looking at inter African partnership and agricultural research center in Egypt and the National Research Center, which is the biggest in Africa and the Middle East. Good to, for me to mention what we are looking at in the future, NRDF. I'm not going to uh, take much time on that. Uh, and I believe that uh, our thinking, even as at yesterday, as um, the next meeting I'll be going to that I mentioned is in respect of uh, the establishment of National Research and Development Foundation. This foundation is going to be having about 5 billion USD uh, in portfolio, uh, essentially looking at not only funding of research, but other research activity. We have the strategic elements, about nine of them, and research activities just uh, one of them. We want to see how we want to institutionalize R&D across the country and not only in our tertiary institution. 
local and retain activity sectors of the economy. Our vision around that, like I mentioned, is institutional R and D, and then these are our strategic goals, including, like I mentioned yesterday, transition from brain drain to brain tap to brain gain. Was center of Nigeria, try and partnership and uh, establishment of a special focus vehicle, which is the National Randy Foundation, to get that one uh, done. Es essentially, we are going to be having a competitive, and we are going to be have uh, be part of the global economy and uh, be more competitive as a nation in both our products and services. That's part of our uh, goals, and uh, we hope to achieve that. And these are the prioritized areas of our national economy that we are looking at in terms of the thematic book for the NRDF, uh, about 13 of them. Uh, you look at them all together, they are contributing about 85 to 90% of our national GDP. So we are strategic about it. And uh, where we are, part of what we are discussing resides is in education, ICT and digital economy, including um, uh, other uh, social development. So I think uh, open science is going to actually play a role across all board. And, and uh, I think we are trying to mainstream it in any of our activity uh, going forward. Uh, these are the draft bill that uh, Mr. Owen mentioned. This is going to be the summary of what you want to know about the bill. And essentially, we're actually looking at how we want to give a right to Nigeria, like I mentioned earlier, uh, which is going to be using research and development, innovation, and enterprise. Uh, for us to assist the universities and uh, our tertiary institutions to foster relationship with industry and let us be globally competitive, at least as a country. We do this with other countries and we are doing it in other countries. Why not in Nigeria? Yes, we have our challenges, but I think we cannot continue to be celebrating challenges. We need to actually move on and see how we can actually break some yoke in our little cells. We cannot solve the problem overnight, but we have, we have the opportunity in everybody's little cells, we can actually add value. In all of this, the law of third form presently allows it to access 2% of the education tax, but we are looking at NRD from the perspective that we need to actually attract investments into the R&D space, either through LDI or FDI, foreign direct investment. Because as of now, the fund at third form, NRF cannot uh, accept uh, additional funding from anywhere. But here we heard that we know that um, there's no demarcation worldwide when it comes to R&D. So you can actually do some cross-border work uh, with uh, colleagues and you can mention innovation, development and uh, enterprise. I think my conclusion finally is for us to actually seek the support of everybody to see that we all can actually situate the issue of uh, open science, open research is in the National Research and Development Foundation that is coming up. We have opportunity to be part of it as we are going to start our, our what we call a focus group meeting by the 8th of February next month, and it's going to be running for six months. That's going to be the final phase of our engagement. The first level of engagement is for us to have the thematic group work together, and then we have moved to what we call the VIC map. The VIC map is virtual innovation knowledge management platform that we run uh, throughout last year, 2021, uh, for the 13 sectors of the economy through a global engagement approach. We don't want a situation whereby anybody we said uh, is not being carried along or any Nigerian is going to be disenfranchised to contribute to this. So we run that session online virtual. And uh, I think uh, the report is what we're actually working on now. The second phase of, uh, of that session, which is going to be VIC part two, will be sector-based. And it's going to, that's what we call the focus group meeting, starting from February uh, 2022. And it's going to be running through, I think, uh, July, August. So the essence is for us to call everybody to come and actually support this particular dream. We believe that NRDF is going to be the special post vehicle for transiting Nigeria from a laggard and backward resource-based economy to a knowledge economy of 21st century and beyond. And in all of this, all what we are trying to do is to make sure that we provide a right for Nigeria to actually attain sustainable development and become a country of good reference. And we believe that open science is going to play a key role, open access, open methods, and uh, open research. At the end of the day, we hope that we are going to have what we call the citizen's science. Thank you very much. And I hope I've communicated what I need to say for now. Thanks. Mm -hmm. God bless. Thank you, uh, Dr. Popola. That was. Um,
very succinct and very clear. Before I open the questions, and I know you're also very busy, so if you can bear with us just to spend a, a few minutes to answer some questions. Um, I have two questions I want to ask you now. I think I'll ask the first one, which is maybe very pertinent. Um, and it's a little bit political, but I was thinking, uh, Professor Popola, is it not possible that Tedfon RDSC could add open science as an additional thematic group to uh, RDSC so that that open science uh, uh, advocacy and view can be clearly heard as a 14th thematic group? Yeah, that's, it's one, not question. Not that's one question. Um, yeah, let, me just, let me just reply immediately so that uh, we take it one after the other. It's okay. not possible because it's not an activity sectors of our economy. The business for selecting those because they are core activity sectors of the economy. So open science comes under what we call cross-cutting. So, and then we have a map for cross-cutting issues. So, I mean, we can be talking about pharmaceutical, medical agriculture, and they are only a place where open science resides. So that is how it's going to be treated. Right. Um, well, I, I might discuss that a little bit more um, offline with you because okay. um, Fund is doing so much, obviously, and uh, it, it's fantastic the work that, that Ted Fund um, are doing. Um, and I also believe that um, so much more can be done in the uh, open science, open research aspects, even with some of the ongoing activities that are, are being done by Ted Fund. Um, I strongly believe that there's opportunity to imbibe more open science, open research paradigms, even in some of the activities that uh, Ted Fund are currently engaged in. Um, and a, a specific example is towards the uh, development of a repository for ETDs. That again is some of the, a, a project that should be done with all the, the the uh, typical standards that uh, permits. But I will take that uh, on with you offline going forward. The other question I, I, I wanted to ask was again, in terms of greater collaboration, you actually mentioned about the cluster two funding for phytomedicine, which is uh, really great. Um, so I know that a number of uh, institutions have these uh, centers of excellence that are funded by um, the World Bank. And I was just wondering if there's any collaboration or overlap between the funding that's going into the centers of excellence for research and what you're doing. So for example, when you talked about cluster two, I know that uh, the University of Joss houses the uh, center of excellence for phytomedicine and the cluster two funding that Ted Fund is engaged in also deals with phytomedicine. So I was wondering if there's, the, the, is there any overlap uh, or collaborations in, 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 the, in that manner? Uh, okay, so let me just say that uh, uh, the University of Joss is one of the institutions that, uh, in fact, the P high of one of our interventions for COVID uh, uh, work actually is from uh, that centers of excellence. Uh, even before we established our own centers of excellence. So uh, what we did was that uh, they are actually looking at repurposing of hepatitis uh, C drug. Uh, Sorry, we can't, I can't, hear you. can't hear you, Prof. Can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you now, yes. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, that center that the Ted Fund is already working with the center. I uh, haven't identified them as a, uh, the Center on Phytomedicine. Uh, when we have the incident of uh, COVID, one of our COVID, special COVID grants actually went to that place for the repurposing of silamarine, silamarine, B drug or C, and that's going to be repurposed for uh, COVID. And I think the project is ongoing, it's not concluded. However, what I showed you that was cluster, we give them the leverage and opportunity to actually collaborate as much as possible. So what we have seen even in the poster one is that if you know much about the, 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 the science and the other guys that are in the space of they are already part of the 
You need to push your mic close to you, but, uh, Professor I, you're coming in and out. We're not quite hearing you. So I, I think it should be network because uh, okay. I'm still maintaining the same position okay. where okay. it was for the presentation. Maybe the, okay. it's network. the okay. network fluctuation. Okay. So, so basically, we allow those uh, core clusters to actually collaborate as much as uh, they can achieve. And uh, I think we don't have But that same time, we recognize them and we're working with them on, uh, on different cloud, I mean, on other projects, and they, they're encouraged to have this uh, cluster. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that clarification. That, that does help. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. I don't see any in the uh, in the Q and A uh, chat. If there are any questions or any comments for uh, Professor Popola or on previous presentations, uh, any comments? If you have a comment to make, you can raise your hand before we we uh, close the session. Right. Okay. Um, Professor Conrad, do you have any comments to make before we, we close or any observations? Okay. So uh, I guess, uh, well, I guess for now, Dr. Mustafa has covered a lot. We have a lot to chew. Let's <laughs> chew on that. <laughs> you do. Okay. So um, it's about seven minutes to 12. Um, so on, on that note, I want to thank uh, Professor Mustafa Ayapopola for taking time out of his very, very busy schedule um, to present not only today, but yesterday also. Uh, we do appreciate um, the time that TED Fund is taking now to engage uh, more with NRENS and, and all the efforts that they're making to engage and um, be more, uh, even more open to the research and education community and for all the, the information that's being provided. I hope to be part of that focus group meeting next, uh, next week where we can also put across some of uh, uh, our uh, uh, thoughts. Um, and for everyone that's come and attended today, uh, this morning, uh, really appreciate your presence. All the, um, all the presentations will be shared uh, at the end of the conference. So you, you, will, get, you will get that. Um, so I wanna thank you all for attending. And um, I'm also looking forward to, I'm very excited about the afternoon session actually, just because of the uh, caliber of international speakers that we're having. So um, I wanna thank you all for being here today. I hope it's been, informative and you've got some some information that will will help you in terms of looking at ways you as researchers or your institutions can um, access more um, funding for your research um, but i really do look forward to having um, most of you back at one o'clock this afternoon for the second session of the day um, and um, those of you that registered for the session, you should be receiving an email notification for that session round about now. Um, so I look forward to seeing you in the afternoon. But for now, thank you very much to our panelists as well. Um, uh, Professor Conrad, who uh, came in on behalf of uh, Professor Tyro. So I look forward to seeing him uh, in the afternoon as well. And um, please um, enjoy your lunchtime and see you in the afternoon. Thank you very much.